How far will you go to push the limits? Defy the laws of physics to be a top gun? Play chase with the biggest snake in the world? Risk a broken neck to go bareback? Mind over matter, you'll need it. One of the most complex planes in the sky, the F-18. To fly one, you need to be serious about fitness and about training. You can risk death even before you face the enemy. The Pacific Ocean, exact coordinates classified. The USS Constellation carries a squadron of F-18 Hornets. Real-life Top Gun, Captain Matt Taylor, earns around 40,000 euros a year. He can make around five times more as an airline pilot, but he's not one to take the easy option. Half the battle's playing in the jet. In our case, it's way on the back side of the ship. Most people wouldn't even make it through the training. Meteorology, aerodynamics, engines, navigation, computers, electronics, combat. Oh, and how to cope flying at close to Mach 2. This is the, uh, the G-suit, and uh, this is full of, uh, full of air bladders, and it, uh, when you pull G in the aircraft, uh, it uh, inflates and basically squeezes me. Uh, it squeezes your legs and torso to force the blood back up into my head, because the, uh, when you're pulling G-forces, it pulls the blood out of your brain. You can actually pass out from it. This is custom fit to our body. Uh, it's pretty... Uh, pretty complicated, really, how the whole thing works. 6 a.m. in the briefing room. On top of everything else, it helps to be a tactical genius if you're to outwit the enemy. Even on training missions, Matt's equipped with a gun, flares and a survival kit. If there's an accident and he's away from the carrier ship, his only option would be to eject and drop into the ocean. On a typical flight, uh, we'll, uh, we'll walk to the aircraft about uh, 45 minutes before takeoff time. That gives us time to do our pre-flight, uh, make sure all of our gear is checked, uh, check all the maintenance documents and uh, so that we're aware of what maintenance has been on the, on the airplane and then, uh, then we'll hop in. For the next five hours, Matt will take off and land 12 times on just 18,000 square meters of constantly pitching deck. Acceleration on takeoff, zero to 280 kilometers per hour in two and a half seconds. Static thrust, around 10 tons per engine. You do get used to it after a while, but there's nothing that simulates it. I've ridden the roller coasters that, that say they're like a catapult shot, and they're, they're, not. <laughs> they're not. They're not even close. But it's very violent. It would injure someone if they, if they didn't know how to do it, or if you weren't prepared, you know, if you weren't prepared for, uh, for what it's like. F-18s cost around 45 million euros a piece. And that's in Matt's mind too when taking off in 10 meter high waves. This job, wherever it's based, carries enormous financial as well as human responsibility. The whole flight is like a sprint. Uh, you're, uh, as soon as you take off, you're busy turning on your systems and getting ready to do whatever mission it is that you have briefed. And then uh, from that point on, you're busy performing that mission. So uh, there's very little time where you're, uh, you're never bored. You're, there's, there's very little time where you're sitting there with the autopilot on and just looking around at how, at how beautiful it is. Four arresting cables stretched across the deck stop the aircraft within 100 meters after landing. Miss this target and you're dead. You've got to get it right first time. Pilots constantly train on dry land before attempting the real thing. Ongoing training must be fitted into an already packed schedule. It's a long time. Uh, it, it, uh, I mean, you kind of get into a rhythm and the days start clicking by, but uh, 
there's no weekends. Uh, Saturday and Sunday are just like every other day, and uh, or at least there's always work to be done. Uh, so it, uh, it it does get long. Matt gets a call to the flight deck. It could be a night trip, or it could be a mission. Either way, he has to prepare in exactly the same manner. Every operation starts with a walkover of the plane, even though he flew it just hours earlier. This is a job where you rarely get second chances. This is the, uh, the back end of the gun. Check to make sure that it's ready to be armed. I know I'm flying uh, an airplane that's built and maintained by the best, best people in the world and, uh, and with the best maintainers in the world. And uh, I have confidence in the people I'm flying with and the training that I've had. highly volatile cocktail of aviation fuel and dozens of missiles like sidewinders, harpoons, shrikes, mavericks means everyone must be absolutely certain of their role. It's at night that most accidents occur. Darkness can play tricks with even the most experienced of pilots. There have been several crashes in fact uh, the acceleration giving the pilot the sensation that he's pitching up very rapidly when he's actually not. So he pushes forward on the stick and flies right into the water. You have to think about everything that can go wrong, not just enemy attacks. I don't know if you ever get comfortable landing on a ship at night, you know, flying over Iraq. Even this was still more stressful uh, uh, sometimes uh, than, than, actual, than actual combat. To stay alive in a Hornet on a rolling deck in the open ocean or pulling G's at 15,000 metres, mind over matter can help. And when living by the seat of your pants is taken literally, you'll need more than positive mental attitude to see you through. Coming up, broken bones and no danger money, inside the world of bareback rodeo. But first, these waterways are home to a creature so big it can swallow a deer whole and even take on a crocodile. Would you go paddling here? Welcome to the Llanos grasslands, shared by Venezuela and Colombia on the fringes of the Amazon, home to the anaconda. Jesus Rivas has studied more than 900 animals in the field. Now, he's paid around 16,000 euros a year to be an expert in the world's biggest snake. At least he saves money on shoe leather. On my way to the marshland, I wear shoes, but as soon as I wade in the water, I prefer moving barefoot, because then I feel everything that's below my feet. So, if I tread on a terrapin, a snake, or a crocodile, I just feel much more comfortable being barefoot. Be careful, the water's flowing over here, which is dangerous. All sorts of things could bite you. Victor is the guide and assistant a lifelong local hunter and rancher in the Llanos. His job? To lead Jesus to the green anacondas and help with observations. There's a snake here. Victor's happy to help. Far from the killer snake reputation, the anaconda is more killed by humans than it is studied. Sometimes when I come here with Jesus, there are places where the water is right up to our hips. If I ask him, what should we do if a giant anaconda swims up next to us right now? He always has the same answer, just keep cool. Jesus launched the Anaconda Project in 1992 to find out more about what the snakes eat and how they reproduce. Yeah, 
Jesus is out to save them. But at four metres long, sometimes more, Anaconda Rescue would seem to carry long odds for a two-man team. But Jesus knows how to increase his chances. Now a scholar at the University of Tennessee, this local boy has a lifetime's experience. He knows that while anacondas are extremely defensive, they tire easily and they rarely attack humans. Prized for their skins, usually the snakes are the victims. For the anaconda, the fairest game is the capybara, the world's largest rodent. The attack itself is really brutal. Firstly, the anaconda bites, then it winds its body around the victim and presses mercilessly. The pressing causes the supply of blood for the heart to be cut off. And the prey eventually dies of asphyxiation. For Jesus, this is far more than a job. It's a passion. He's an expert on the Orinoco crocodile too. Has helped their reintroduction into the Llanos grasslands. At least anacondas don't bite to kill. Provided you stay out of the constrictor's clutches, you're fine. Jesus has radio tagged 38 anacondas and studied the mating, pregnancy and delivery of more than 47 females. He tries to limit how much he handles the snakes, but at the end of the day, it's for their own good. Clipping a few scales means he'll be able to recognize this snake in the future. Assuming he can find it again, alive. Bad news. Reports from ranches of a dead and very large anaconda in a nearby river. He sets out to investigate, fearing that it might be the female he calls Madonna, that he hasn't seen for five years. She was last measured at four and a half meters long. Is this her carcass? Victor is worried how Jesus will react. He lives for his snakes. He's always searching for them. He does an ID. It's not Madonna. She had smooth skin with few markings. The reason he nicknamed her Beautiful Girl, or Madonna. The relief is massive, but he can't afford to relax. There's still the night shift to do, far more risky, especially with reptiles on the prowl that really do attack humans, like caimans and crocs. So little is known about how anacondas survive out here, especially at night. Scientific curiosity pushes him on. It's not what it looks like. These men are from a local anti-poacher patrol. They are here to help. Next morning comes the news he's really been waiting for. A massive anaconda has been spotted in a waterhole, just a kilometre away. Sluggish on land, these snakes move quickly in water. Jesus had better be quick. Four 
and a half metres, it's a huge specimen. The name anaconda comes from the Tamil word anicolra, meaning elephant killer. The early Spanish settlers named it matatoro, or bull killer. It could well be Madonna, his old friend. I'll have to take her back to the lab and check her out in peace to be sure. But I think it must be her because of her size and markings. It must be you, little one. It's so good that you're still here. Jesus is more than pleased. Finding her still alive after all this time means that his efforts to protect the snakes may be paying off. Thinking on your feet comes with the territory out here. The body can be trained to react in the right way and not cave in to fear. But if you're not careful, the mind can take quite a beating. We travel to Fort Worth, Texas, for one of the most physically demanding rides around. Could you take this? Forget knowledge, forget training. They can't help with this kind of pain. Kristen David is a bareback rodeo rider. If she wins, she gets paid. If she doesn't, she just comes back for more. Um, broke both my ankles, uh, broke my hands. Um, had a pretty serious injury in 96, um, where I spent days in ICU and, and kind of messed up my heart, whatever, because it doesn't beat real regularly now. Lots of bumps and bruises. You gotta have a little bit of craziness, a little bit of eagerness wild, willing to try anything. I was born and raised crazy. <laughs> Kristen's in a three-day event, and there's every chance that someone will be leaving in an ambulance. I've really got to get myself pumped up and ready, and I dance all the time. When I'm back behind the shoots, I want to hear some pumped up music, and I'm dancing behind the shoots and jump around and I gotta keep stretching all the time. It's just before I get on, um, I really psych myself out. It just gets my adrenaline pumping. Day one. Kristen needs to stay on board a ride for six seconds to register a score. This is the rigging, a strap. No stirrups, no saddle. Then, with a simple nod from the rider in the chute, First ride, first injury. Kristen's horse trod on her upper leg when she fell. Enough to send most people home, but not for a bareback rodeo rider. What makes Kristen tick? It's hereditary. Uh, my mom started riding when she was 12 years old, and I've been in rodeo all my life. It just kind of, every daughter has been in the bareback ride. And I just pull up the standings, yeah. And this is Mum. Jan is a veteran bareback rider and now a teacher. At 62, she's the oldest woman on the circuit. Are you hurt, Jan? Okay. It's just something I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy. It's something you find nowhere else. And I said, I'm kind of selfish. This is what I do for me. I've got a lot of things I have to do for everybody else, but this is what I do for myself. Kristen is lucky if she can take home around 1,000 euros per two-day event. It's a million-dollar industry, but the lion's share of the prize money goes to the 500 men who compete. So Kristen has to pay her way another way. I'm a, a ticket counter gate agent for Continental Airlines at Dallas-Fort Worth. If the customers could see her now. Day two, and she's determined to prove herself. At least to do better than Mum. She failed to last the crucial six seconds, but at least the only injury is an embarrassing tear on her backside. They need to have Jenny take my car and run to the hotel and give me a pair of pants. What? Yeah. I know, the crowd was loving the pants for him. 
I mean, people say, you only ride for six seconds. And they don't realize that six seconds when you're on top of a bucking horse seems like five minutes. I mean, there's times that a bareback horse could buck like, you know, 10 times in six seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six, not a big deal. It can be a very long time when you're on something that strong. Bareback rodeo is unique because both rider and animal are judged on their performance. For horses, bucking is instinctive. But it's how well they do it that counts. For riders, you've got nothing to hang on to, but you still need perfect leg positions, good spurring action, and to push the limits of the horse's strength. Weekend rodeo schools can teach you the physical and mental techniques needed to stay in the saddle. Mount and dismount. You want to try and get back as far as you can. Um, you want to be able to pull your hands kind of across and so that it throws your chest back. And you, you're not going to lay as far back, but you want to be able to lay back enough that you can keep your feet to the front. The more you go forward, the feet are going to come back. This is Kristen's last chance. She survives the six seconds, but she's broken her hand. The most important unwritten rule in rodeo, never show pain. When you're hurt, you just don't show it. I mean, you show it, but not in the arena. You, you, unless you cannot walk out of that arena, you better go. You know, you don't want to, how do I say this? Um, you want to be, a, you know, you want to please the crowd, but not with saying, oh, she's hurt, you know, you don't want to feeling sorry for you. You, you want to, if you're hurt, you get back behind those chutes and that's where you let your pain out. Kristen won't even let her mother know. She's on next. Sprained it. Uh, Can we do something? Got, just say I sprained it. Just, just so that she don't know. Otherwise her mind will be focused on something else instead of right. Just tell her we're still examining it. I gotta be she's out gotta there. She's gotta be up there with her. Or she'll know something's she'll wrong. She'll know something's up. I know my mother way too well. Uh, and if she looks at it, she'll know it's broke. Let her do. She'll know it's broke. Bareback rodeo riders know that no pain means no gain. When falling is a certainty, true mental grit must ride over the doubts. It may not look like the roughest trade, but the bareback rodeo rider does seem to risk injury a lot more often than either the anaconda expert or the real-life top gun. 